Marius Ola, good morning. It's very encouraging to see so many of you come out. Uh, Jake just had a slight misrepresentation of my nerves. He said slightly nervous. I am <laughs> extremely nervous. But I know that God has this. He is bigger than we can ever imagine. And that's the assurance that I'm resting in. So today I want to greet you with Psalms 100, the latter part of it, verses 4 and 5. And most of the scripture that I've written down today is out of the ESV. So if you're following, your translations might be slightly different. So again, out of Psalms 100, verses 4 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. So to this weekend is Thanksgiving weekend. So I was trying to come up with a Thanksgiving message. And usually when I think of Thanksgiving, I think of reflections. When we reflect on all that we have received over the past, whether year, life, or the last few weeks. And seeing Jake and Lisa here this morning, I'm just overjoyed to see that they're here and I can imagine how blessed they feel that they're able to, in a few weeks, come from where they were to where they are now. So it's a huge blessing to see them here. So I thank you guys for coming. <clears throat> Again, as we think about Thanksgiving, I could just think about the things that we're all familiar with that have gone on in the last almost two years. So we think, again, I think we're all pretty familiar with what's going on since early 2020. The world came to a halt. First, we were told that your children would have an extended March break. I'm sure they were all excited, you know, don't have to go back for an extra two weeks. So I'll just give you a bit of an insight into where I was when this time happened, when everything came to such a screeching halt. I was in college finishing up my studies, and I recall, I believe it was a Wednesday morning, I came into class, and the professor jokingly saying, schools will be closed by Monday. And I remember thinking, as you were walking through the halls, you would see the odd time somebody wearing a mask, and it was just like, that seems so strange that somebody would choose to wear a mask. We were talking about that at work the other day, and then we said it almost seemed dehumanizing. <clears throat> and yet today, we look at it, it's weird to see somebody outside without a mask. And I remember thinking, yeah, right, there's no way that this can happen that quick. It was my last week of studies. The following weeks, we're going to start doing our final exams, and then school was going to be done for me. On Friday of that week, we came in, and the teacher saying that there would be announcement that afternoon regarding coronavirus. That was the first time I heard the word coronavirus. And sure enough, it said exactly what I had hoped it wouldn't say. He said that schools will be closed for two weeks at least. Now, if you remember, all my studies were done. I had just final exams to do that were worth about a quarter percent of the overall mark. So needless to say, I'm frustrated. How am I supposed to retain this information that's been crammed into my brain for the last nine weeks, for two weeks, maybe longer. They didn't say how long, but at least two weeks. So as soon as schools closed, I had to go back to work. And as most of us know, work is what work is. There's never enough hours in a day. And then soon after, the restrictions started. First, we were told to put up shields. Start social distancing. If we had five people in an office, three or four of them had to move out. We couldn't be that close. 
then start wearing masks. School being out for the remainder of the year, we were told. Now there's no graduation for students in elementary school, no prom for high school students. Then we're told we can't get together with family for holidays. We can't even go and visit someone that we love that's dying in a hospital. We're prevented from getting together in church. That one was particularly tough for me. Just the restrictions and everything just kept mounting up. And then a few weeks ago, we have an election in this country. We're told that the election is gonna cost, or cost us $610 million. And for what? Just to get us back to exactly where we were. So almost two years later since this has started, we seem to be stuck in the same vicious circle. This is where my thoughts were as I was preparing to write today's Thanksgiving message. So when we skim over the last year and a half, just quickly like that, it can be difficult and at times even undesirable to be thankful. How do we as Christians continue to maintain an attitude of gratitude in the midst of these circumstances? I believe it has a lot to do with where our mindset is at. Where are your thoughts? Who are you associating with? And what kind of conversations are you having with the people that you're around? If you're able to surround yourself with like-minded people, you'd be amazed how that changes your attitude towards almost any situations. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul instructs us to set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. And in verses 12 through 17 of Colossians 2, we read of what kind of conduct setting our minds on the things above will produce. Starting in verse 12, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. To set our minds on the things above is to think of the eternal qualities that were promised. When we shift our thinking from the temporal to the eternal, that thinking will produce Christly conduct. Remember, this is not a conduct that we can manufacture. This is a Christ-produced conduct, meaning that Christ is the one that produces this conduct in and through us. <clears throat> So I reluctantly titled this meditation today as Thank God. So today we will look at a few ways that we can still be thankful to God in the midst of all the things that are so distracting, frustrating, and I would dare even say at times these scary events that are happening. This has robbed so many of us of the joy and peace that God wants us to have. But before we go any further, let's start with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, 
We come before you with hearts of praise and thanksgiving. We thank you that you call us your sons and your daughters. We thank you that though we find so many reasons to feel frustrated, annoyed, and at times ungrateful, Father, I confess that I am guilty of grumbling and griping about all the surrounding events. I have failed to be thankful and to remember that you are at work in my life, even through all this trouble, even now. Father, help us to accept both life's challenges and your restoring help with grace and gratitude. Help us in remembering that no problem is too great or too small for us to call out to you. And Father, help us to remember that a heart can be filled with joy every day, not just in the easy days. Thank you, Lord, for life, for your life and your hope. Father, I confess my need of you this morning. Thank you that even at my weakest, I can rely on your strength. Father, we pray this morning that you would open our ears to hear your voice. Fill us with your spirit anew and teach us to depend and rely on you, to listen for your voice. And when you tell us to move, teach us to move, not out of our own strength and ambitions, but may you move in and through us as you see fit. Remind us again and again of your great love for us. Father, you are amazing. And as we sang this morning, we need you every hour. May you have your way this morning. May your truths be spoken and heard here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Thank God who sustains us. Do we really believe that God can sustain us? Do we believe that God sustains us even in all our everyday life? When we're doing dishes, when we're cutting the grass, when we're driving to work, or when you're having a bad day at work? What if I lose my job? Is God concerned about that? Some of you may have lost your job since COVID. I don't know. And I'm not saying these are easy things to go through. Going through job loss is never fun or easy. It brings about a lot of anxieties and stress. Many times I recall the pastor saying that when they are up here preaching, that they are preaching to themselves. If we think about sustainability in the carnal sense, or earthly thinking anyway, the first thoughts that came to me are of job security. That's my livelihood, especially in this country where most of us are not farmers, where we can sustain for a time from the harvest. We rely on having employment that we can go to on a daily basis and collect our sustainability. So for me to think on losing my job, right away I think about my responsibilities as a provider. How am I going to provide for my family? If I'm not working, how will we buy groceries? How are we going to pay for the mortgage or the rent? If we can't make the mortgage or rent payments, where would we live? And I think we're all aware of how expensive real estate and rent is. How will we make vehicle payments? If we can't make the payments on our vehicle, how will we get from place to place? As I was writing this down, I looked at it and had to admit that my thoughts are on the temporal. The things on this earth, though not bad, but on the temporary. That's when that verse comes to mind. Set your mind on the things above. You see, we are so self-sufficient. We're so good at taking care of ourselves. We're so good at sustaining ourselves that when something so routinely normal, yet significant as vocation, 
comes to a halt, we don't know what to do. How about when something else happens on a much bigger scale? Like normal life as we know it before COVID. Again, we don't know what to do. What we do then is we react. We react similar to the reflex of your leg. Like when the doctor checks your reflex on your leg with that hammer thing. We don't mean to kick, but as soon as he knocks your knee, whatever is in the way is going to get kicked. In a case like this, what we tend to do without realizing it is what I would call consult your troubleshooting guide. It comes with every piece of equipment that you buy, whether it's a washing machine, probably even a hair dryer. Not that I need one. <laughs> but it comes with everything. If this doesn't work, check this. If this doesn't work, check that. If that doesn't work, call the manufacturer. So what we do is we consult our troubleshooting guide. I work in maintenance, so a troubleshooting guide is something that we rely on heavily, and we're always updating it. But what a troubleshooting guide is, is a multi-step process to coming up and testing out solutions to a problem and then implementing that solution. So step one is usually defining the problem. Step two is collect relative or relevant information about the problem. Step three is analyze that information. Step four, has enough information been proven for the solution. If no, you go back to step two. If yes, you move on. Then you propose the solution and test it. Did this fix the problem? If yes, you implement the solution. If not, you go back to step three and analyze the information. This is a difficult, or a default setting of the flesh. We've heard it here often speaking from the other pastors that we resort to a formula that worked last time, and that's what a troubleshooting guide is. This happened before. What steps did you follow to get back? Once we've exhausted our troubleshooting guide, what do we do? What's the last resort? Contact the manufacturer. That's when we go to father with the problem. The thing is, is we go to the wrong troubleshooting guide. We go to the troubleshooting guide independent of father. We do not go to the dependent on father guide. That guide is available to everyone. This is literally a troubleshooting guide. Blew me away yesterday when I was reading, writing that down, is that we don't need to look far. You look at the Israelites. We can see plenty enough problems recorded and how they tried to come up with their own troubleshooting guide and how they failed over and over. But we need to familiarize ourselves with this troubleshooting guide. If it's just collecting dust on the top shelf, then it won't do us any good when the problems come. God's troubleshooting guide, he proposes a solution. Do you know what that solution is? It's Jesus Christ crucified. And then it asks the question, does this fix the problem? Yes and amen. So let's implement the solution in all our everyday life. So if you notice the progression of my list of worries, we see the first thing was family, then shelter and food, and then possessions. These are all not bad. But I recall a few weeks ago, Pastor Jake and Pastor Corny both shared with us about how God wants that first place in our hearts, his place. After all, that's how he designed and he created us. 
He created us to be occupied by him. You see, God designed us to be dependent on him. In Exodus 20, verse 3, we read, You shall have no other gods before me. And in this, God's is spelled with a small g. I had placed three things on the list, and that's when the Holy Spirit convicted me, or checked me, as Pastor Mike said in his message last week. God checked me and reminded me that I was looking at the wrong guide. We're never supposed to do this alone. Let me rephrase that. We are not supposed to do this alone. We are not meant to do this out of ourselves. The world teaches independence, that you can be whoever you want to be, look out for number one, etc., etc. And where has that gotten us as mankind? We need to go to our Heavenly Father, who promises that He will never leave us nor forsake us, according to Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6, where the Hebrew writer instructs us, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. And in Matthew 6, verse 31 through 34, we read, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." Here we see Jesus himself telling us not to be anxious. And again, depending on your translation, it may say worried. We are not to be worried about the everyday things. Jesus tells us that our Father in heaven knows us. After all, he created us. He knows that we need all these things. He promises us that when we seek him first, the rest will be added onto us. That doesn't mean we get whatever we want or that we will get our preference. No, he says the rest of the things that will be added onto us are the things that we need, like shelter, food, clothing, and so forth. Jesus also reminds us not to worry about tomorrow. And I believe this is an important instruction. So we don't miss out on the blessings of today that are in the present you don't have to think too far ahead, an hour, a day, or depending on what those thoughts or anxieties are, you can be stressed to the point of hyperventilating in no time. I think about the time when I was in school just finishing up with my studies, when we had to stop so abruptly, and I remember thinking, how am I going to remember all this information and for how long? Because again, there was no indicator that as to when schools would reopen so we could go and write the exams. This was only the first step into the anxieties that I had. I tell you, it was exhausting, frustrating. And looking back, I believe I missed out on many of the blessings that God desired for me that day or that time. We miss out on his present now joy, his present now peace that he so desires for us to have here, today, right now. Maybe this is where you're thinking, Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. I can't possibly have peace or joy or not be anxious about tomorrow. And the reason I say that maybe those are your thoughts is because I used to have those same thoughts that a pastor doesn't have or doesn't struggle with the things that I struggled with. And you're right. Maybe we don't know what you're going through. So come find us. Any one of us. 
talk to us about what you're going through. Sometimes it's amazing how much peace there is in just sharing our struggles with each other. And you might be surprised to find that you are not the only one, that others have the very same struggle. We are a church, members of one body. That reminds me about two weeks ago, I hurt my thumb somehow. I still have no idea how. I was cutting the grass, and all of a sudden my thumb hurt. So, I'm, so I massage it a bit, and I was like, man, my thumb really hurts. <clears throat> but you know what? Right away, that sore thumb stuck up and out like a sore thumb. That's funny because it was a sore thumb. <laughs> anyway, the thumb just got right out of the way, and the rest of the fingers took over what the thumb was doing. So similar to that, we as a church body are called to do similarly, take care of each other. And I'm just thinking of uh, the Peters brothers, that family, so suddenly that their father passed away. Right now is when they, they need someone to come alongside them. So if you know them, if you have their information, I'd just encourage you to just send them a message of encouragement. Let them know that you're thinking about them. You have no idea how much that means. This last couple of weeks, probably the last six months, I've had so much encouragement from people sending me just a short message saying that God's got me or thinking about you. It is super, super encouraging. So if you're hurting, let us know so that we come, can come alongside you and hurt with you. If you're rejoicing, let us know so we can come alongside you and rejoice with you. God sustains you by never leaving you. God sustains you by adding all the things that you need and when you need them. We just need to give him that first place in our hearts. And God sustains you by bringing people into your life that will struggle alongside you and that will rejoice alongside you. Thank God for sustaining us. <clears throat> Thank God who loves and cares for you. God not only provides and sustains you, he loves you and he cares for you. He cares about what you go through. Isaiah 43, verse two tells us, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. We will all pass through waters and rivers of hardship and uncertainty. And again, one example of uncertainty that I think we all face from time to time is job security. Am I going to be able to continue working? And we will also walk through the fires of life, having someone you love in hospital that you can't go and visit. And this is where I think of Jake and Lisa when Jake was in the hospital. Just the so natural things that we want to do Or maybe you've had to say goodbye to someone during this difficult time. And please know, I'm not trying to make light of this, of anything that you have gone through or that you are going through. But know that God promises, I will never leave you. I will be with you. And I love that he says, I will be with you personally, presently, and intimately. I heard this poem I am written by Helen Malicote on one of Dr. Charles Stanley's sermons. When I heard it, I thought that it was a wonderful reminder that God is a present God. And the poem goes as follows. I was regretting the past and fearing the future. Suddenly my Lord was speaking. My name is I am. He paused. I waited. He continued. When you live in the past with its mistakes and regrets, 
it is hard. I am not there. My name is not I was. When you live in the future with its problems and fears, it is hard. I am not there. My name is not I will be. When you live in this moment, it is not hard. I am here. My name is I am. I will be with you, God says, in the midst of the fire, right while we're in the thick of it. Pastor Mike preached uh, about it several times of how we will often pray for God to take the situation or circumstance away from us. We want to be on the other side of the fire that God is leading us through because we learn valuable lessons but we would prefer not to go through it. We pray for him to take us out of the circumstance. Instead, when we are in the midst of the river, we need to choose. Remember, he won't force us. He gave us free will. So we need to make that choice and go to Father and claim his promises. When I pass through the waters, you are with me. And when I go through the rivers, you tell me that they shall not overwhelm me. And when I walk through fire, I shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume me, for you are with me. And we have a beautiful illustration of God protecting someone in the fire. In Daniel chapter 3, verses 21 through 25, we read the story of three men who were thrown into a fiery furnace because they would not bow down to worship the golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Starting in verse 21, then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flames of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Can you imagine how hot this furnace must have been? The men throwing these three men into the furnace, they succumbed to the flames and they didn't even go in. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men abound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods." Just like we see in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he was with them. He could have chosen to take them out of the circumstance, but instead he chose to be with them because it glorified him to be in the midst. So we can be sure that whatever circumstance befalls us, that he is with us because he cares for us. Peter invites us to cast all our anxieties on him for he cares for us in 1 Peter 5 7 here again we see the word anxiety here Peter is calling us to cast all our anxieties or cares depending on what translation you have on him Jesus capital H because he cares for us we as Christians have this awesome privilege to throw all our discontent discouragement despair and suffering on the Lord and to trust him that he knows what he is doing with our lives. I don't know about you, but there's been times where I have questioned my trust in casting my cares on him. With all the restrictions that we've had to comply to and are still subject to, we don't know when this will end but he does. And we can trust his promises. Thank you, God, that you love us and care for us so deeply. He loves you. In closing today's meditation, I'm going to be sharing a hymn that I came across. It was written by August August Ludwig Storm, and it goes as follows. Thanks to God, my Redeemer. 
Thanks for all thou dost provide. Thanks for times now but a memory. Thanks for Jesus by my side. Thanks for pleasant, balmy springtime. Thanks for dark and stormy fall. Thanks for tears by now forgotten. Thanks for peace within my soul. Thanks for prayers that thou hast answered. Thanks for that thou dost deny. Thanks for storms that I have weathered. Thanks for all that thou dost supply. Thanks for pain and thanks for pleasure. Thanks for comfort in despair. Thanks for grace that none can measure. Thanks for love beyond compare. Thanks for roses by the wayside. Thanks for thorns their stems contain. Thanks for home and thanks for fireside. Thanks for hope, that sweet refrain. Thanks for joy and thanks for sorrow. Thanks for heavenly peace with thee. Thanks for hope in the tomorrow. Thanks through all eternity. One day in 19, or 1891, August began considering all the reasons why he needed to be thankful. He knew it was easy to thank God for pleasant things, but on that day, Storm remembered that we should also be thankful for everything that happens in our lives. In this spirit, Storm wrote that hymn called Thanks to God, in which he listed the 24 things for which he was thankful. He wrote, Thanks to God for my Redeemer. Thanks for what thou hast provided. Storm recognized that we need to give thanks in all circumstances. So instead of just thinking about the roses in life, we need to also be thankful for the thorns that come along with it. We will now have a moment of quiet prayer. Then I will close that prayer and then followed by the benediction. And then the worship team will come up and bless us with closing songs. So right now, no matter what you are facing, I invite you to consider all the reasons you have to be thankful. Think about what he has done for you. Be specific. Tell him how you are thankful or how you're feeling it or finding it difficult to be thankful right now. Remember, he knows you. So whatever you tell him, he already knows and he loves you. Recall God's promises that he has a plan for you and that he is with you right now and that he never leaves you. With these thoughts, I invite you to a moment of silent prayer where you are willing and able. Please kneel with me in prayer to the Father. Father, thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves. Thank you for strength. Thank you that you sustain us, not just in our earthly needs, but that you had a plan to sustain us in eternity. Father, I thank you for the many prayers that were prayed on my behalf. Father, the support that I've received has been overwhelming. Father, teach us through your troubleshooting guide that you have provided us with a solution for every circumstance, whether preferable or unpreferable. And Father, I thank you for the harvest that again so richly provided us, that you so richly provided for us again this year. But most of all, Father, we thank you that it pleased you to provide us with the solution, with the solution meaning our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you so much for coming. It is a huge blessing to see so many of you guys coming out.
So today's benediction is out of Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. God bless.